Birds do it, worms do it, animals and mammals alike do it. We all take a sizable chunk of the day to tune out the world and to slumber. Here to explain the science of why we sleep, Richard Horner, professor of medicine and physiology and the Canada Research Chair in Sleep at the University of Toronto. He's also the author of The Universal Pastime, Sleep and Rest Explained. Lovely to have you here. Thank you. We're going to stay awake for this whole interview though, okay? Sure. Only if the questions are good. Let's do an excerpt from your book to get things started here. Sleep, you tell us, is not simply a passive stopgap in the 24-hour treadmill of life. Sleep is not just a period to power down between bouts of behavior, nor is it simply a period to hide away and avoid predation. Sleep is an important component of life in all organisms that exhibit complex behaviors in complex environments, functioning as a device to enhance waking behavior, and so maximize the ability to reap the benefits of the opportunities available in a complex world. I want to start by getting your opinion, and you've heard this before, people who say, sleep? Lots of time to sleep when I'm dead. I'm going full bore ahead. What do you think of that attitude? Well, I may have had the same attitude myself when I was younger. I think the... And some people, of course, uh, do die prematurely if they don't sleep or tired and crash their cars. I think the, the issue is uh, waking performance is affected by sleep. It boosts it in many important ways, which we'll get to. Uh, but there's no doubt, if we take the human kind as an example, uh, performance does decline, whether we like it or not, after 16 hours and after 18 hours. It gets to levels equivalent to when we've had enough alcohol that would make it illegal to drive. So the, the process of sleep is not a switching off. It's a very active process. And this is, I think, the realization that brain science is bringing us. Why are you interested in this? I've always been interested in science in general. Um, I've always been in, interested since my childhood in um, brain function. I got into this uh, as a PhD scientist, kept my interest for 25 years since. I just find it a fascinating topic, uh, but I think more importantly, beyond the, beyond the basics, we know that what it's like to get a good night's sleep. Brain science is telling us a lot about brain function. But the separation of wake science and sleep science is as, as, as artificial as nature nurture. They go together, not just in us, in other living things. And sleep is as much an important component of life as wakefulness, but it's had less attention. When you are asleep, what's your brain doing? Well, my brain and the brain of everybody else is, is not switched off. This is a common um, assumption, uh, but common sense tells us this. We dream. So the dreaming brain is, is uh, a wake-up call, if you like, to tell us the brain is active in sleep. But it's not just confined to dreaming sleep in the other stages of sleep, the non-dreaming phases. The brain is ac active as well, just in a different way. Active how? Well, the, the experiences of the day are received by the brain. And they uh, respond, they incorporate information, some of which we're aware of, we want to learn things, some of which we're unaware of. We go through life experiencing culture, experiences of family, experiencing school, which influences our behaviors. And what sleep does, uh, brain science tells us, is this, that all that information is stored in areas of the brain. And during sleep, they move from one area to another. It's different parts of the brain chatter to each other. And it, the brain is a distributed network, not unsimilar to the hubs and spokes of the World Wide Web or other connected networks. And information gets shunted around. Therefore, the brain changes. It changes its structure. Every night, uh, because of this chatter, we wake up the next day, technically, a different person because we've incorporated all that information. So it's a very active state, and, and really that is the, what I think informs uh, our knowledge currently about sleep. Do you dream? Yes, I do. Do you dream in color or black and white? You know, I've... I've asked myself that question, but I've never been conscious enough to be aware of it. I'm more of a, I, I, I feel the dream. Sometimes we can be aware of dreams, which can be fun sometimes. But I think the, int the interesting thing about dreams is, is they, they dreaming has informed our culture so much. It's been very influential with Freud and Jung, for example. And it's, it's, it's perhaps been given more weight than perhaps it need be. It's, it's led to so many speculations, some religious, some not. But uh, my dreams are emotional to me because they are p personal to me. And my brain is personal to me in the same way that your dreams may be personal to you. Why are some people night owls? They can go and work or 
party or do whatever they want till one or two in the morning and then, you know, be fine the next day. And others uh, got to be in bed by nine, nine thirty every night or they're hopeless. So the two, there are two powerful drives on our 24 hour behavior. One is the internal body clock, which has has really assumed a major importance to not only society, but human health. It's, very, it's a very interesting subject. That's uh, determined very strongly by our genes. So it's like your parents still telling you what time to go to bed. <laughs> um, and the, so that is, that, that is a very powerful drive, but it can change. This, and this is for the same reason we can change time zones by flying somewhere. We can change time zones without going anywhere and experience something like social jet lag because the same stimuli apply, like artificial light, for example. And the second um, powerful drive is the, what, the drive for sleep. And when those two things go together, people function very well, but often they don't. And, that, and when, they, when the, the sleep phase is, is, say, a night owl and people feel tired when, at one in the morning, that may not gel very well if they had to get up at seven mm. to go to the class or to work. So it's the mismatch of the two, which is, in its simplest form is the reason for a lot of sleep mm. complaints. This is from The New Yorker from earlier this year, uh, excerpt from an article there. Over the past five decades, our average sleep duration on work nights has decreased by an hour and a half, down from eight and a half to just under seven. 31% of us sleep fewer than six hours a night, and 69% report insufficient sleep. When Lisa Matriciani, a sleep researcher at the University of South Australia, looked at available sleep data for children from 1905 to 2008, she found that they had lost nearly a minute of sleep a year. It's not just a trend for the adult world. We are, as a population, sleeping less now than we ever have. How come? Well, I think, well, number one, it's, I think the hum, the, there are these two important drives we talked about. I think what's happening now is this influence. We're delaying our bedtimes because of the exposure to artificial light. But it's, 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 it's not necessarily the, the accuracy of how long people slept is, is Somewhat so questionable. I'm familiar with the articles that you, you question them, but they're very good. Um, the the lesser sleep is this is the proportioning of where we where we allow the sleep phase to happen. It's not to say that we're actually not sleeping very deeply now because there's a lot more activity to process, which is part of what the, the sleep is doing. But I think the idea that one size fits all for everybody with sleep is the same as saying that. Um, we should all wear the same, same size shoe. Some people can function very well. So there is no gold standard. You've got to get X number of hours per night. I think the prescription element of sleep is not the question we should be asking. I think the question we can be asking is, uh, what do we require to wake us up in the morning? Do we require that alarm clock to hit us on the head and drag us out of a deep coma? Um, or does it gently nudge us into wakefulness? And when we enter wakefulness, are we experiencing a waking experience? Are we top of our game mentally and functionally? And I think when people ask those questions, that's, that's really the, the answer we can ask for, answer for ourselves. What should our expectations of sleep be? The expectations, I think, certainly for adults, shouldn't be that we should sleep like a baby. The, I never knew what that meant. You know, well, does sleep like a baby means means a wonderful sleep, or up every three hours screaming and crying? Well, that's that's a good one because it depends on the the baby meaning sleeping for twelve hours a night deeply. This would be the example. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I think this becomes very important with respect to the the burden of insomnia, which people, which is really increasing. The the levels that people report anywhere between ten to thirty percent of the population complain of an inability to fall or maintain, fall asleep or maintain sleep. And I, the, and one of the roots of that problem is, that, again, this idea that we should think about, A, when, when are we preparing our bodies to enter its natural period of rest and inactivity, and when do we allow that window for sleep to happen? But with young professionals, students, uh, uh, the, the pushing, pushing the envelope and be, being a night owl is the norm. Uh, we may suffer a few years of perhaps not being alert in the morning, but it works well for the work that needs to get done. But as, as adults, when the burden of insomnia increases, it's because we may expect this eight-hour sleep because that's what we've been programmed to think about. But the experience of waking up in the middle of the night 
should be perhaps considered the norm. Mm. And just to go back to your previous question, link it to this one. As a society, we've really constrained this, the sleep period. We've, we say, right, we, we, this is the time that I'm allowing it to happen. It may be 11 till 7 or midnight till 7. There's no wiggle room there anymore. So if anything actually interferes with it, then there's not enough time to actually feel refreshed. So I think that's, that's the problem nowadays. It's, it's, there's, no, there's no elbow room left. Can you train yourself to do just as well in life on less sleep? I, I think the, the issue there, again, is, is to prioritize sleep enough, recognize what disturbs it, number one. So you can push it so far. And when you push a little bit further, things are less optimal. But it's a question of how much we prioritize that. I think we all can appreciate that the three tenets of, of healthy living are nutrition, activity, and having a good sleep life. But we give and take because life is complicated. We give and take on all of those things. And it's very difficult to maintain an optimal balance between them all. I think the, the, the power of discussions like this and programs like yours is, is the dissemination of information. People can then make their informed choices, which is, is really the important thing. How common, in your experience, are people who have significant sleep disorders? I don't mean getting up in the middle of the night once in a blue moon. I mean, this is a thing. This is uh, really, I think, one of the levels of discussion that has really brought sleep science to the forefront of, of general awareness. You can read, you quoted the New Yorker, there's articles coming out all the time, Scientific American had big things the last month, for example. It's all over the place, it's covered all the time. Um, so the, I think the, the, the important thing is that the awareness of the multitude of sleep disorders, sleep apnea, uh, insomnia. What What's sleep apnea? Sleep apnea is a condition when certain areas of the brain, when they change their activity from wakefulness to sleep, we all know our postural muscles relax, so do the muscles that uh, help us breathe through here. We all know we need our lungs to breathe, but it only works if you can get air through into, into the lungs through this region. Mm. And when those muscles relax in some people, the airway closes, so they don't sleep as well. Insomnia is very common, but there's a whole multitude of sleep disorders. Some of them uh, and, uh, are, are very important for mood and mental health. And this is really, I think, one of the other big agendas for uh, prioritizing sleep health, that, that whether it's the, the relationship to mood and mental health. And I think this is one of the big areas of new science. Wanted to follow up on that. What, so a lack of sleep or sleep disorder can genuinely affect somebody's positive mental health. Yes, yeah, so I think that the one, one of the really emerging ideas in uh, neuropsychiatric uh, and neurodegenerative uh, disorders, it used to be the idea that, I'll, I'll just praise it with this. So there is no known neuropsychiatric or neurodegenerative disorder that does not have a sleep abnormality. They all do. And the interesting, well, the idea had previously been that they're, they're just a symptom. They're a manifestation of the multitude of things that are going on. The idea now is, is actually they can actually contribute to. So we'll, we can take two examples. One of them is, is Parkinson's. The, the, by the time someone is diagnosed with Parkinson's, it may be uh, a little too far in the, the line of progression of the, degener the neurodegeneration to do something about it. It turns out through new science of the last uh, five or so years that patients with uh, Parkinson's, for example, have, uh, have some sleep problems with respect to acting out their dreams that's, that's, that's present 10 to 15 years before. Now, that's, that's, that, so the sleep is providing a window on the brain. And it, the idea can be that it, uh, if we can spot this early enough, and you can institute interventions that can slow it down or prevent it. And you can start them early enough that they may work. Alzheimer's another one. Uh, science tells us that sleep is a process that can flush out certain toxins from the brain, including am amyloid, which is related to Alzheimer's. And so there's a lot of interest in whether or not um, sleep as a biomarker may predict the onset of Alzheimer's. But I think the other important thing is, is mood disorders. Um, there's a lot of serious mood disorders that have a sleep component. And often the response is to give a sleeping pill or do something like that. It's, it would be an interesting approach, and there's a lot of activity in this area, to actually prioritize sleep health, work through that, and then if you can reduce the burden of um, the use of, uh, of drugs that alter a lot of things in the brain, not just promote sleep, then that might be a great help. Well, okay, that, that uh, you've sort of... Uh 
anticipated my next question, which is, are you a fan or not a fan of, of using sleep aids to get to sleep, particularly given this connection to mental illness that you've just raised? You would think that if you need help going to sleep, and it might, at the end of the day, stave off mental illness, then it's a good thing to take sleeping pills. Well, the, it's, it's a fine line because it depends what conditions we're talking about and how severe they are. The, one of the difficulties with sleeping pills, which are very commonly described, uh, prescribed, is that they are very useful at times in which they're needed, which is great stress. So we all go through, as we live our lives, great stress. There's burdens of work, there's burdens of financial strain, there's uh, family problems, bereavement, and like it or not, we all experience one or more of those. Yep. So the, the prescription, which should be short term for a lot of these sleeping pills, should be three months and to help people through, but often they're prescribed longer than that. Now the problem with that is that they're very hard to get off once you're on, so this idea is called rebound insomnia. So it's, it's a very difficult thing, that's why I think you need very well-trained physicians who know about sleep, and this is one of the issues that uh, the hours allotted to it in the medical school curriculum are, are very few. Yet, in the medical practice, a lot of people present with sleep problems that may, may be related to their health concern of a, of a variety of, of, of reasons, mm -hmm. but sleep often comes up. Is our biology at odds, our circadian rhythms, all of the things we've been talking about, are they, at the end of the day, at odds with the kind of 24-7 culture we now live in? I'm not sure that they're at odds with it, although that's, that's often the way it's portrayed. I mean, the, it's an interesting thing that life evo has evolved on this Earth for three and a half billion years. We're late on the scene, but uh, we've been around from the point of view of our biology being built for a very long time, but it's only the last 200 years that we've invented artificial light. I can see you, you can see me, we understand about rods and cones in the eye, but it was only 10 or 15 years ago, we, there's a third photoreceptor that informs the brain about light, particular blue light, it doesn't care whether it's artificial or from the sun, but it does influence our body clock. So that is new, but understanding it, we can work with it. I think the only thing that becomes problematic is when we have this uh, phase of sleep that we try and fit in and sometimes it moves around and we might not take it at the optimal time or we don't, if we have en enough time allotted but something interrupts it. It's this, there's no wiggle room as I mentioned before, so that's when the, the, the cognition and the brain function becomes impaired. You do sleep well, don't you? Uh, usually, not always. And thankfully not during this interview. Richard Horner, author, The Universal Pastime, Sleep and Rest Explained. Thank you for explaining. Thank you very much. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit supporttvo.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.